Okay. So I, I, this is not going to be a 10-minute introduction that takes an hour. Trust me. So at least I hope not. <laughs> okay, so first a little background, just some po points I want to make. Um, NumPy, Matplotlib, and SciPy are the foundation of the scientific Python stack. And a huge amount of stuff that's related to data science, and just manipulating data in Python, depends on these libraries. And these libraries have had a huge amount of work by a large number of people over a decade or more. And really more in the sense that SciPy, if you start poking around the source code, you'll find bits and pieces of it are written in Fortran and were written at, say, national labs and so on for numerical computing work um, over the decade before SciPy even started. So you find code from the late 90s and so on for like numerical integration and stuff. So it's really high performance, very well tested code. Um, some of the, is this laptop? Some of the same foundations as you find in um, MATLAB, for example, but in Python. Oh, and I want to just, I wrote NumPy, Matplotlib, and SciPy, along with Cython, are the foundation of the scientific Python stack. So I'm plugging Cython there. Um, there's a big unified community. So when I started using Python to do kind of numerical stuff in addition to other things, when I was kind of putting together Sage, it wasn't at all clear what the numerical library you should use for um, arrays was. So there was a library called NumArray and another one called Numeric. And they were competing libraries for working with uh, matrices with floating point entries. And one of them was written by astronomers and was very good for large matrices. And another one was written by people that aren't astronomers and was good for small matrices. And they had kind of competing APIs and people working on them. And um, Travis Oliphant kind of systematically went through and wrote um, NumPy as something to unify these two projects. And so fortunately now, when people want something that does uh, n-dimensional arrays and a huge amount of stuff with them, they just choose NumPy rather than having to choose between multiple competing open source libraries. So the situation is really good now. Um, the actual implementations of NumPy, SciPy, and Matplotlib, um, NumPy, a lot of it is written in C, in the C language, directly against the Python C API. It would be natural, and you might imagine it should have been done using Cython, but a lot of it was written before Cython or its predecessors existed. Yes? Uh, what's the C API? So Python itself, if you go to the Python website, download python-versionnumber.tard.gz, there's a, the source code of Python, it's actually a C program. It's just a big C program. It takes about one minute to compile from source, at least last time I built it directly. And as a C program, it does kind of, you can view it from two perspectives. One, it's a C program that makes certain functions available. And those um, functions are the Python C API. It's an application programming interface for accessing a bunch of functions. The other thing it makes available is an interpreter, which takes Python files and, and turns them into bytecode and runs them or lets you interactively work at the command line. And so you can view Python as a C program. And it's uh, very nicely written, very clean source code, well commented, and so on. Um, I will avoid the temptation to just download and compile Python right now but I'm very tempted to do so, but I'm not going to. Um, but I, yeah. Uh, so the Python C API, so remember when you used Cython, you wrote a little bit of code and it looked a lot like Python. Did you ever have to worry about manual memory, manual reference counting? Like every time you created, uh, say an int or a float or an object of some sort, did you have to explicitly increment a reference counter and then later explicitly decrement it to avoid memory leaks and possibly mess up and do it twice and get a seg fault or something. No, Cython just automatically takes care of all of that. When you directly write C code that will be used from Python against the Python C API, you have to do a lot of that stuff manually and it's tricky, but you get kind of optimal performance. But that's all that was available when NumPy was being written. So likewise, uh, Matplotlib, it's another big thing that you can view as a Python library, but it's um, mostly written in C++, a lot of it. And it's just exposed and made available from Python. And this is for speed reasons. So Matplotlib, um, it lets you draw lots and lots of beautiful plots. It's a foundation on which you can build other plotting libraries. Like all of Sage's 
2D plotting is built on top of matplotlib. And matplotlib can export to lots and lots of different formats. Like you describe, an, um, a, I guess, a figure in matplotlib, and then you can say, save it to a PNG file, save it to a PDF file, save it to an SVG file, um, anti-alias this way or that way. And there's a whole bunch of really tricky C libraries and C++ libraries behind the scenes that matplotlib is using in order to implement this functionality. And then finally, SciPy, it's a program that's a lot of written, a lot of it's written in C, a little bit in Python, and then some in Fortran, and it's all kind of linked together. So these libraries are not just like a bunch of Python code that you could run anywhere that you can run Python, but they're very, very fast. So a lot of the functionality, when you call, you make a matrix, you say, give me a random matrix of these entries and then do, multiply it by some other one. It's as fast as you could possibly expect in any language. It'll be faster than, or as fast as anything you'd write directly in C or Fortran. And that's why people really, really like using Python for numerical computing. Um, as long as you can figure out how to express what you're doing in terms of NumPy using the operations NumPy um, supports and, and makes available, you can do things very quickly. Um, when I say vectorized operations, that's things like if you have two matrices, you add them together, or you compute the sign of every entry in the matrix, that sort of thing, where you do something that's um, some operation on all the entries of a matrix or an array. That's the sort of thing that NumPy, for example, is super good at. Um, so this comment is very often you'll hear about somebody made it so you could run Python inside of Java or Python on some just-in-time compiler that's available or something like that. Or Python, you can run Python in your web browser. And usually what that means is that the core Python implementation could be run that way, but you start poking deeper and import NumPy or you know install NumPy just doesn't work. Or the same with SciPy. Um, and that's the thing to watch out for. These are really very sophisticated C, C++ and Fortran programs, and they're not easy to get to run in different environments necessarily. OK, a little more details about each of them. So NumPy provides an n-dimensional array object. You already have some experience with it when you were working with data frames. Under the hood, data frames use NumPy arrays to store their data. Um, but notice that there's a cube here that emphasizes that it's not just two-dimensional arrays. For example, if you have an image which has a red, green, and blue channel, they'll, you can represent it using a three-dimensional NumPy array. So if it's a 1,000 by 1,000 image, um, in two of the directions, the dimensions will be 1,000, but there'll be a third direction, a third dimension or shape of your array, which will be of length three. So you can encode the idea of three thousand by thousand arrays in, this, in a single object in NumPy. And that's what this picture is supposed to represent. It's more like a grid in space. Or a four-dimensional, like maybe you have several different grids. They evolve over time. So you represent that using a four-dimensional NumPy array. It's a very powerful data structure. Everything works in a nice, uh, fluid way. Um, here's a NumPy tutorial that I've linked to. And if you're bored with the homework, I want to work on it in a few minutes. This is something to look at. You can just go through and try all the examples. It's very, very um, just step by step. So like, there's just lots of examples. You copy and paste them into a worksheet, maybe change them a little bit, and play around with the, some, with the functions and read the documentation. So it's just lots and lots of examples like this. Um, next is matplotlib. So there's a link to the website. Oh, and, uh, well, so matplotlib is a 2D Python plotting library that produces publication quality figures um, and so on. So for example, anytime you draw a 2D plot in Sage, under the hood it constructs a matplotlib figure and then draws that or renders that in some way. And then uh, SciPy, it has lots and lots of numerical algorithms in it like for numerical integration, optimization, root finding, etc. So it's like it does the heavy lifting. If you have like some surface and you want to find a local maxima, it does that efficiently. Or you um, have some function and you want to integrate it over a grid using one of various algorithms. That's the sort of thing it's very good at. It provides a lot of the overlap with the core functionality of MATLAB. And again, there's a tutorial for SciPy and a tutorial for Matplotlib. One other thing with matplotlib is if you Google for matplotlib gallery, um, you'll see a large number of images. And this is useful when you're just trying to figure out how to do something with matplotlib. So these are all 
plots created with matplotlib. And when you click on one of them, um, like this complicated looking one, then you can click on source code, or I think it's also included right here, and you can see what code produced that rather complicated plot. But these are the sort of plots that come out of matplotlib. You can tell that they, um, they look somewhat familiar to you. They kind of, after all, uh, pandas, for example, builds on it. So the legend might look familiar. And the quality is just generally really good. There's lots of nice like anti-aliasing and alpha rendering. Sorry, but maybe it'll keep you on your toes. Um, at least it doesn't flicker really quickly. It doesn't mess up the screencast. Okay, so that's uh, these three. All right, so that really was just over 10 minutes. Okay, next we're going to talk about the three problems. I will talk more about NumPy, Matplotlib, and SciPy on Wednesday and Friday, depending on the sort of questions you have when you're working on your homework and the tutorials. All right, so next um, let's look at the homework. So you should all have a copy of this, but here it is. There are three problems um, in here. Let me zoom in. So make sure you look at that uh, plot on the right because you will not see it, I think, when you look at your homework. Since it happened, I drew it and then we accidentally deleted it and it's cached in my browser. But that's kind of what your answer is going to look like to give you a picture in your head. So aim for something that looks like that, at least for part three of the problem. Okay, so that's what it'll kind of look like. So in this problem, you're going to return to the Mexican hat that you remember from a while ago, and you're going to try to draw a plot of it, including the formula for the hat. And you'll draw it first using Sage's normal 3D plotting. So this part is almost exactly like something you've done before, except you're going to put um, a label somewhere using text to show the formula in the picture. And as you can see where I said not, the text should not look good. It's going to look really bad because there's no support in 3D in Sage for directly drawing um, LaTeX. And also the results of, you, all you get out of this is a PNG image. So that's what you'll see in problem one. In problem two, you're going to use Sage's ray tracer. There's a program called Tachyon. It's a very fast parallel ray tracing program. So what it does is it takes a description of a scene and then simulates shooting light at the scene and then figuring out what the color of every point should be. Like the light bounces around, you get shadows and stuff like that. Sage has this, it's how it draws a PNG image um, statically of a 3D scene. And so this guides you through drawing the Mexican hat and some text, which again will not look good. So if you can't get the tech to look right, that's not your fault. It's because nobody's ever implemented it yet in Sage. Um, so you'll draw it using you'll draw it using Sage's 3D plotting plus Tachyon. Then the third part of the problem is you're going to draw this Mexican hat surface, but instead using Matplotlib, which has its own 3D plotting capability. And here, one nice thing is that it really it produces a nice PDF image. So it's a vector graphic, which you can include in a LaTeX document or a Word document or whatever, and it looks publication quality. So it's something you can really put in a paper that you'd submit. Um, and it does a really good job of rendering LaTeX formulas and so on. Okay, so you'll get a nice 3D image this way, but it's a little bit more painful to use. Okay, so that's the first problem. Problem two is about uh, histograms and also Sage's interact functionality, which gives you interactive controls um, like sliders and drop down buttons and color selectors and so on. Um, so what you'll do here is this is a little uh, function that if you evaluate it and run it, which I'll just do that, then it draws a histogram using matplotlib. Okay, so that is a you know very nice clean histogram, right? It's easy to create, and this is the matplotlib code that you use to draw that histogram. Um, who here has some experience with MATLAB? Does this code look Kind of like MATLAB at all, hopefully. I mean, it should be almost identical to what you would, except for the PLC dot part. Like the step after is very similar to MATLAB. Um, it should be like similar options and so on. The, the API, you see, which is um, where it says import matplotlib.pyplot as PLT. What that does, this PLT thing, it's something that has functions that are 
models as close as possible on MATLAB for those functions. So like MATLAB has text, axis, grid, etc. And then you'll get something that looks like what MATLAB might produce, but I think prettier. Okay, so what you're going to do is do a bunch of things with this histogram. So you'll um, change it so that the function takes inputs, and then instead of just drawing everything, it'll be parameterized by those inputs. So you'll be able to change the color of the histogram, et cetera, just by changing the inputs to the function. Then the next thing you'll do is you'll put um, this little decorator, this is a <coughs> Python decorator, right before the function you had above, and it will turn every single one of the inputs into a little control, where you'll be able to type a number, and then it will, right when you type the number, it'll update the output with that. So it'll be an interactive, like, um, kind of web application of little input boxes. And then what you'll do is modify the, you'll learn about this interact thing, which, let me click here so you can see what it looks like. Um, uh, Try a random thing. Basically what Interact does is it lets you make little things where you have sliders and you get some output. And it's kind of very easy to use. Or input boxes, um, sliders, check boxes, etc. So what you're going to do is make it so that like the color of the histogram, you use a little color selector. The um, uh, other parameters use sliders and so on. Okay, so you'll do that. And then here you will uh, add another button that lets you change the distribution. That histogram was a plot of sampling from the normal distribution, but you can plot from, you can sample from other distributions that are provided by um, NumPy. And so you'll just choose, there's a whole bunch you can choose from, so you just choose two others, and then adopt the code so that it samples from those other distributions. So that's problem two. And then problem three, the last problem, involves um, image compression using singular value decomposition. And so there's some code here that should actually, I think, work, but it doesn't really do all the things that you're supposed to do. But it, it's enough to get you going. So there's an image called a, a example line.jpg, and it's been uploaded here. And then this code uses singular value decomposition with certain parameters to uh, compress that image and display it compressed. Um, I'll make it a little more compressed by changing this parameter to 5. So what you're going to do is modify this code to change like how it gets displayed. Instead of this image, you'll use an image of your choosing. And um, you can also read in either of these two references or somewhere else how singular value decomposition uh, lets you do image compression. So. So one part involves uploading an image and going through these steps to um, compute the singular value decomposition and show a compressed version. Uh, it shouldn't be hard because you just basically copy this code above and make some changes. And then you're going to uh, try varying the parameters and seeing how good the compression is or how bad it is. And then um, something else involving how compressed it is. Like, um, and then something else. Fiddling with values. Okay, so those are the, the problems. Um, hopefully it'll take you less time to do them than it took us to make them, um, but we'll see. And again, I strongly recommend looking at these tutorials that I've linked to. Um, you'll learn a lot by just making a blank worksheet and then trying lots of things in the tutorials going through there. Um, it's like a good systematic way of getting a sense for how things work. All right, so that's everything I'm gonna lecture about. And are there any questions before you start working now? So you have about a little over 23 minutes. So you can start working on some of the homework or going through tutorials or whatever. And various of us will walk around and answer questions. Okay.